Many of the survival resources of the Kimberley are common throughout the region and are often found in other parts of northern Australia. The main difference between the Kimberley coast and its high country lies in the creatures and plant life which rely on salt water and in the landforms. Here in the high country they can be extremely beautiful. I guess if there's a heart to the Kimberley, it's got to be around here somewhere. Because this land formation, which perhaps is the oldest formation of land in Australia, runs all the way through 200 kilometres right up to the coast. On one side we've got the Glenelg River, and on the other, the Prince Regent Gorge. Even in the dry times, such as now, the streams and the rivers and the springs all flow and produce water. So Aboriginal people, when they lived here traditionally, would have found it reasonably easy to subsist. I say reasonably, because subsistence is always difficult. Aboriginal people had a different perspective on the landscape to European people. The first European or white man to have his ventures in this area recorded was a fellow called Gray. And he put ashore right up on the coast and tried to walk down through this area. He looked around and saw nothing as far as fruit and vegetables was concerned so he planted some of his own. The mind boggles as to exactly what it was he tried to grow in the Kimberleys, but I can imagine it with things like cherry trees and peaches and apples, which wouldn't have existed too well. But there was no need to do that, because this countryside had been supporting Aboriginal people for 40, 50,000 years. When I look around here and see some of the vegetation that is here and producing fruit, even at this time of year, Gray was wasting his efforts. I can see over here about five different examples of billy goat plum or salty plum. Let's go and have a look at them. Well, even if Gray had recognised these as being bush tucker, and that's pretty unlikely, he would have had no idea of their particular nutritional value. We only found out ourselves about four years ago. We put these through the laboratory, and we found, to our amazement, that this little fruit, which is one of the terminalias, is extremely high in ascorbic acid, vitamin C. In fact, it's so high, it now leads the world. So you see, it didn't matter how many oranges or apples the Gray may have planted, he couldn't compete with this one. I guess the best way to equate the value of this, and it's only about as big as a thumbnail, is this way. One of these fruits is equal to eating eight or ten oranges from a vitamin C point of view. And if Gray had done that, on his trip through here, he would have had no scurvy problems whatsoever. A Darwin-based company is investigating farming the salty plum. The only other native Australian food plant that has been commercially successful is the Queensland or macadamia nut. The common name for these terminalias is salty plum. And as I look around here, just this fine, small area, I can see about a dozen examples. It's a real little grove in itself. Of course, it would be different if I came back in three months, because then the fruit would have dropped and the trees would be bare. That's half my problem. I've got to keep coming back to areas to capture the seasonal change and the seasonal alteration. Aboriginals had to do the same thing, and that's why they move so often. There are some species, however, that last for extended periods throughout the year. And some of those species grow in this area. I guess probably one of the best examples of a species that does last a long time is the pandanus. The pandanus, or screw pine as it's commonly known, was mistakenly identified by early European settlers of northern Australia as the breadfruit tree of the Pacific Islands, a plant which offers greater food resources than our pandanus. I guess of all the plant species in northern Australia, the pandanus would be the most representative because it grows right throughout the top end and it's very commonly found, particularly 
around creek lines. For Aboriginal people, though, it didn't represent a great resource. The food, the fruit that is, could be eaten, but generally was accepted as being a rubbish food, used in emergencies only. The parts that were eaten were, in fact, these segments, and this fruit here is dropping its segments and littering the whole floor around underneath the tree. What happens is this. The segments fall off. If you like, you can suck the ends. But that's a bit of a problem. Leichhardt found that out. He tried it and got burnt and blistered lips. Leichhardt tried all sorts of things, in fact. He got so desperate at one stage, he even ate his saddlebags. Anyway, if you were to cut this in half, what you find inside each one of these segments here, a long, elongated almond-type nut. I've cut one in half and I'll just show you what I'm talking about. Down here somewhere. You can see inside the segment half a dozen small almonds. They can be prized out with a pair of tweezer-like instruments. In fact, Aboriginals used a split twig and dug it in and pulled the almonds out. But it was a lot of work and a lot of energy was expended getting them. So the food was a rubbish food. Additional to the food source, though, we have the leaves. And these were split just like this. And the thin strands were then taken and used to make baskets. And they can be split into any number of segments like that because they run along the lateral veins like that. And sometimes they were used for twining and tying up things. It had one third and final use, and that was the root system. The roots could be pounded up, mashed up, then boiled in a broth and sipped to relieve the symptoms of coughs, colds and flu. Not all foods were commonly accepted in this category across Northern Australia. In fact, it's rather interesting when you think about the Aboriginal people, the way the tribal groups are separated and yet all butting up against one another right around the top of Australia. People in one side, the eastern coast, will not have the same food values as people, say, in the western coast. I'll see if I can find, I think I saw, there's a plantaria over here, we'll have a look at that, because that typifies exactly what I'm talking about. The plantaria species is common throughout coastal northern Australia, and is a plant that offers a variety of survival resources. This is the tree that I was talking about. It's Sunday dressed up name is Planchonia Korea, in other words, cocky apple. It's called cocky apple because the cockatoos in particular like eating the fruit. But it's rather interesting because I found when I was cataloguing, and this tree in particular, different uses by different Aboriginal groups across the top of Australia. I think it was first shown this tree about 1979, up Weeper or Arakoon Way. And up there the people told me that you could eat the fruit. Well, that's perfectly correct, you can. Later on, a few years later, I went over to Millingimby, over in the top end of Arnhem Land, and there I asked the people about this tree again. They didn't know anything about it being able to eat the fruit, but they did know that you could use the root system as a medicine. What you could utilise was the bare root system cut away from the wood, heated on a fire and applied to a sore tooth. The sap contains an analgesic, and that affects the nerve in the tooth, putting it to sleep, thereby stopping the toothache. So then I had two uses for this particular plant two different Aboriginal people had told me that from two different areas. Finally, the third use cropped up in the Kimberley, and that was the fact that this thing here is a fish poison. You can crush up the bark, wash it in the water, and kill the fish in that pool of water. It doesn't contain any toxin or anything like that, but what it does do is cut down the oxygen content in the water, causing the fish's gill system to fail, and therefore they come float belly up on the water. The red sap of the bloodwood eucalypt is a valuable medicine also. This is the bloodwood. And you can see by the colour of it why it gets that common name. It's got this bright red colour and it was used as an antiseptic by Aboriginal people. They'd mash this up, add some water to it, make a poultice of it and put it on a wound. And within a few days the wound had begun to heal. We've since analysed this and found that it does in fact contain antiseptic, and that's why it worked. But Aboriginal people always knew that. Water 
is the essential element of all life forms. And where it occurs in quantity, like here in the mighty Ord in the northwest Kimberley, it often provides an abundance of food resources from water and land. Many are easily gathered, like this native Australian fig. This is the cluster fig, and you can tell why it's called a cluster fig, because of all these clusters coming out of the trunk. I reckon it's probably the best fig we've got in Australia growing naturally. It tastes very, very similar to the domestic fig you buy in the shop. And inside, you've got the normal fig structure, complete with the odd grub walking around, fertilising the flower. The fig tree itself, this one here, always tends to grow in close association with water. It needs that water to survive. Consequently, if you ever see a fig tree like this with big clusters on the trunk, you know that somewhere very close by is a good, reliable water source. You might have to dig for it to get that water, but it's got to be there. Here, in this particular case, we've got a river source, a fairly large one, just over the way there. And while we're still here, we should go down and have a look at that to see what resources, survival resources, can be found around the banks of that river. These figs are quite excellent. Well, having a bit of a quick look around here, I can see about half a dozen resources that are worthwhile. There's one in particular which is quite spectacular. And that's the Tipper Augustifolia, commonly called bulrush. And it's growing on the other side of the bank over there, so I'm going to have to go over and do a bit of a swim for it, which I can't complain about on a day like this. The uh, bulrush, of course, grows all over Australia, not just here in the north. And uh, for that reason, I guess everyone will be able to recognise it in their own paddock, wherever you happen to live almost, except in central Australia, of course. It tends to grow around the edges of waterways. It's got to have that water, otherwise it doesn't survive. And uh, it proved quite a basic, useful product to Aboriginal people when they existed in areas like this. Anyway, I'm off for a swim. The Ord is only one of the mighty river systems that drain the Kimberley and often provide obstacles for Les. Much wildlife is dependent upon such waterways and in bygone times it was hunted and eaten by Aboriginal people. This tipper grows like a big forest right now, down to my knees in mud. Back up again. Looks like a big cane farm. Really not going to happen, that lot. Anyway, this is what it's all about. And you might be able to see little clouds of yellow pollen going through because we're here at exactly the right time of year. The new flower buds are producing pollen all over the place. You can see the old flower buds, these old fawn-coloured ones, and on top of that, we've got the pollen on the new buds. A bit out of breath. Just have a look at this, because this, I think, is quite spectacular. You tap that, and there's all the pollen. And that stuff is edible. Aboriginal people used to get it, mix a bit of water to it, put it together, make a johnny cake out of it, we cook that on the hot coals and then eat it. You can also eat it raw. And it's got a very blandy, flour-like taste because I guess it resembles flour in the way it was processed. Anyway, there's lots of it around here. I'm going to get some samples. Have a look at this. <laughs> 